All right, thanks everyone for being here. And thanks everyone for uh, being here virtually. Uh, so welcome to the July meetup. It's already July. Uh, so we're very excited. We have a bunch of things we're gonna get started on. But first up, the first question we always ask, it's easier for people in the room, but people virtual will do it too. Is anyone hiring? If you're in the room, raise your hand. If you're virtual, go to the NYHackR Slack and post it in the job postings channel. Is anyone physically here hiring? All right. No one is hiring, so I'm always looking for full-time and part-time account executives, data scientists, Linux admins, shiny developers. So come find me, landeranalytics.com slash careers. Let me know if anyone I'm looking to hire. If anyone else is hiring who's not in the room, go on to, like I said, the Slack. You can find the Slack at nyhackr.org, and you can find the Slack, this little like hashtag button. Click on that and find the job postings channel. All right, so that's the first thing. Second thing we always do at the meetup is the pizza. This is the first time we've ever ordered from Zillions. So everyone in the room, get on your phone, dear Alberta knows what to do. Go to bit.ly slash pizza poll, all lowercase, and rate the pizza. We have a scale of one to five, essentially. We've been rating this pizza for almost 10 years. Not this pizza, all the different pizza for 10 years. And if you go to nyhackr.org, you can actually find the data set. You can find it right now, it's an interactive bar chart, but there's actually a live feed of the data available as JSON, if anyone wants to ever analyze it. I highly encourage you to analyze it. So go ahead and vote. And people who are virtual, let us know what food you're eating. If you're in uh, either this, the zoo, oh, sorry, you can go on Slack and go to the monthly events meetup, monthly meetup chat, I think it's called, the monthly meetup chat, go there, tell us what food you're eating, hopefully pizza. Or if you're better off at YouTube, go to the YouTube, there's a live chat there, let us know what you're eating. You can tell there's a big part of our meetup. For those of you physically in the room, after the meetup, we're gonna to go to Beer Authority across the street. Just come and have a fun time with us. We're gonna be going there afterwards. It's right across the street. One of these streets, I'm not sure which way I'm facing. Come with us. Folks at home, crack open one at home with your loved ones. Um, unfortunately, you can't join us for that part virtually. But folks who are here, we'll be going afterwards and I'll remind you as we get going. I wanna thank Microsoft for hosting us here. They've been hosting us for a few months and they're gonna host us for the next few months. So thank you very much to Microsoft. No one from Microsoft is actually in the room, but hopefully someday they know I appreciate them. <laughs> Next week, we are very, very excited for the New York R Conference. I'm very excited that we have workshops Tuesday and Wednesday and the conference Wednesday, Thursday and Friday. Who in the room is going? Some of you, I, thought, I saw another person. All right, cool. Um, and if virtually, if you're going to the conference, let us know in the, in the channel. Uh, we're very excited about this. If you want to learn more, if you don't know about the conference, go to rstats.ai slash nyr, and we'll post these links to monthly meetup chat and to the, the YouTube chat, rstats.ai slash nyr, and go. And if you remember the meetup, which you are, since you're here, the conference started out as an extension of the meetup. So if you use code NYHackR, you get a discount code for 20% off. So hopefully I'll see some of you folks there. Some of you might not have heard of it. Some of you I know already have a ticket, right? Hope, hope, hope to see you there. It's going to be a really good time. It's really a lot of fun. Um, like I said, we have speakers, we have workshops. Oh, and we'll be giving away a ticket after D Rob's talk. We're going to give a ticket to someone in the room and to someone virtually a free ticket to, to those people to come attend. So don't buy it until two hours from now, all right? Maybe you'll win it. And I want to thank our conference sponsors, uh, you know, Posit supporting us, the R Consortium, uh, Columbia University, the Stats Department, and we got a lot of books from book publishers like Springer, Pearson, CRC Press, and Manning. Um, so it'll be a really fun time. Hope a lot of people show up. In August, there's a conference, D4Con, taking place. It's like a general purpose data design discovery conference. It has sort of like a government, sports, and entertainment theme. It's a weird combination of themes. But if you want to learn more about that, d4con.io, and again, the discount code, NYHackR, works for you there. Then, if the New York R Conference was an extension of the meetup, the R in Government Conference was an extension of the New York R Conference. That's taking place in October. I never remember the dates, like October 20-something. Um, there you go, she knows what she's doing. It's the workshop. Yes, so we have workshops and conference, and this is the R in Government, that means federal, state, local, international governments, but it also means public sector, NGOs, schools. So if you're interested in those fields, if you're somewhere in like the public sphere in any sort, you'll want to go to rstats.ai slash gov. And again, your discount code, NYHackR, works for anything we do here. Right? So check that out. We have the August speaker lined up, but we'll announce that like after next week. All right? And I'll be here at Microsoft. September. We have the venue lined up, but we think we have the speaker. We'll announce that in August. Beyond August and September, if you have a company that would like to host us physically in your office, let us know. If you would like to speak, 
let us know. If you want to voluntold one of your friends, let us know. <laughs> That's the way a lot of this stuff gets done. People just get offered up to do it. So, please host us. The key takeaways, vote on your pizza, post jobs in the job postings channel, come to the beer authority afterwards, and come to the conference and come to the next meetups. Cool. All right, so with that, I want to introduce a personal friend, but also a repeat speaker, both at the meetup and at the conference, and at the RGov conference, and a prolific open source contributor, an author, a father, a husband, any other things I should say? All right, so everyone please give a warm welcome to d Come on up here. Hi everyone, it's great to be here again. So if you're wondering what I'm gonna be talking about today, so am I. Today we're gonna to be doing um, improv data analysis. So we're gonna be doing data analysis on a topic uh, and a data set that I haven't seen before. So uh, we've got screens behind me. Up there there's one, uh, I'm confident being live cast. There's also a screen up there. If you're having a hard, a hard time seeing back there, there's, there's one seat up here that's gonna get a better view. Please uh, don't be shy to, uh, to come uh, grab that anytime. So the way we're going to do this is based on data from the Tidy Tuesday project. Tidy Tuesday is an amazing um, weekly uh, data project in R, run by the R for Data Science online learning community. And every week they come out with a data set uh, uh, that has been cleaned and processed a little bit, uh, but it, there's a chance like to try a lot of data analysis methods on. So I've, uh, in the last couple of years, something I've done is, is sometimes run um, screencasts where I open one of these data sets and analyze it while people uh, streaming online give uh, suggestions and ideas. And I really uh, enjoy it. This is the third time Jared's given me the opportunity to do that in person. So the way we're going to do this is, uh, I don't think I've done any of the data sets yet this year, but I think I'm, uh, they sometimes repeat data sets, so I might need an extra number or two. There are 27 data sets this year, I need someone in the room to shout out a number between one and 27. Eight. Eight. Let's get a set, we're gonna have, I'm gonna aim for two options. It's gonna be some, somebody give a, another number? 17. 17. And a backup in case I, uh, in case I already had looked at one of the data sets. Two. Two. All right. So let's see what week number eight is. It's Bob, Bob Ross paintings. I did do, and I love the Bob Ross data set. I did an analysis of that a couple years ago. Is it the same? Let me see if it's the same. Um, oh, colors. Okay, that's interesting. I never, I didn't, uh, the last time I did this data set, it doesn't have, it didn't have colors in it. But uh, it did have season episode. And you know, it's not a lot in common because that other data set was looking at, um, at objects that were in the paintings. But all right, so there's one, uh, but yeah, one is Bob Ross. Second is number 17, which is the London Marathon. Uh, that's, a fun, that, that's a fun idea for a uh, data set, which is the, um, so uh, anyone here run a marathon? New York, somewhere else? I ran uh, New York in 2014 and, and uh, Chicago 2015. Definitely never run the London Marathon. Uh, since having kids, I really haven't run anywhere except to the you know, diaper changing table. But uh, yeah, all right, so we have London Marathon, and let's throw in the third one, Bird Feeder Watch. Oh, man. All right, hold on. This is 30, what does it say? Bird Feeder Watch, a November to April survey of birds that visit backyards. And let's see, so, uh, huh. All right, so we have three. Uh, that's uh, interesting. So we have, we, that data set would include, oh, wow, a lot of pieces of information about is it what birds are seen or just how many birds are seen? Bird species have observed, sort of six letter species codes. Cool, so we have, let's go with those three options. So the three options we have are Bob Ross paintings. For those who don't know, Bob Ross was a, um, uh, an artist who painted a little like, like we're doing here, doing um, uh, paintings on the spot and showing them on, on uh, uh, PBS. It was a really um, uh, lovely show. 17 was London Marathon. And third is the um, third option is bird feeders. So you can only vote for one. Who's voting for Bob Ross? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Uh, uh, anyone for marathon? And for bird feeders? Bob Ross, it is. <laughs> So we're going to um, pull the, uh, the data set. All right, here we go. So the great thing about this data is we, um, we 
uh, basically just copy in, here we go, this line of code. I'm, I'm gonna, let's see, I'm gonna load in my packages with tidyverse, uh, usually like scales package. And uh, read in our data. All right, we have, ooh, 403 observations. So I guess that means 403 paintings. Uh, and let's start by looking at what we have uh, to look at. All right, ooh, we got images, and that means we could do visualizations with these images. So already I'm just taking a look at um, uh, sort sorting it. It looks like, okay, we have one row per painting. Uh, we have seasons, episodes, the number of colors used, a link to the video. I don't, I don't have anything I can do with, with that. A list of the colors. Oh, so we have a few different formats. One is we have a list of the colors used here, a list of the color hex codes. This is completely different than the last data set I, I work with, so that's pretty cool. And then we have, it looks like um, a wide format one row for each, uh, sorry, one column for each of the colors used. Show of hands, who's excited about what we're going to do with this data? <laughs> Me too! <laughs> All right. So the first thing that I, um, I'm probably going to do, let me see, is, is tidy this data a little bit. So the columns that I care about here, I care about the um, painting, uh, sure, painting index, why not? I don't even know if I care about the painting index. It doesn't look like it was in order. Uh, the season, the episode, the num colors, and let's get the colors and the colors hex column color. The colors and color hex. All right. So each of these is a JSON array. What's up? You, you are your. Um, when people don't see your IDE, they see your website. Who's uh, the which people? The uh, on live streaming. All right. One sec. So who here has been using R for more than five years? Who's been using R for more than 10 years? All right, I'm out at 11, no, sorry, 12. Uh, Jer I'm trying to do the math. Oh, let's see, yeah. 16 years? You need to open R to do the math? Yeah, to, yeah. yeah, yeah. Oh, good. Ah, all right, Great. we're back. We're back. So we have two columns here, col color and color um, hex. So these are JSON columns. So um, JSON is a format for serializing uh, data. We're going to want to use the JSON light package. I'm not going to load it because it, um, it, it uh, clobbers a couple of, pa pa of um, functions. What I'm going to do is I'm going to say colors uh, JSON light from JSON and do the same to color hex. What this is going to do is turn these up. It does not like, oh, um, oh, they're with a single string. OK, what I'm going to need to do is create a function called a parse list. Uh, we'll take x and we'll string. The trouble is that JSON expects double quotes. And this has single quotes. So we're going to need go map uh, parse list. Still doesn't like it. Um, premature end of file. Oh, uh, string replace all. Here we go. So now we have two columns, colors and color hex, and the um, and they they're each uh, lists. So we can see. Oh yeah, there's eight in this first painting, uh, nine in this next painting, etc. Uh, if we look at the uh, the data set again, did I miss any columns? I got title. I got all the colors. I got YouTube. Um, oh, and I might want image source. I uh, forgot about that one. The um, uh, all right, so I'm going to call this Bob Ross Tidied. And the most interesting thing we can do with the colors is unnest them. That is, uh, turn them into color and color hex. Turn them, oop, uh, where now we actually have one, in, we used to have one row per painting, now we have one row per color per painting. So we could say, okay, a walk in the woods is no longer one color, it's eight. And uh, now we can start asking things like, what are the most common colors in Bob Ross paintings? So I'm gonna call this Bob Ross, I'm gonna call it long, cause it's like a long f uh, format, one row per color. I don't like that name. I'm gonna call it Bob Ross colors, one row per color. All right, so let's do another thing. Let me rename that column colors to color, cause it's now just one at a time. All right, our first visualization. So we can see, okay, color, is um, 
Uh, the most common color, titanium white. We have some ones like midnight black. There's a painter in the room. Do you know this word? Does anyone know this word? I'm not going to try. That's no that, that's no good. The um, uh, and one thing I'm noticing is we have some extra um, text at the ends of these. There's a function string squash, I think it is, that's going to remove the, string squash, I think, that's going to be removing the um the extra uh, color. So I'm going to the extra white space. Color equals string. Did I get it right? Squish uh, on color. Here we go, that removes the extra white space uh, at the end of the beginning of a string. So I can count that, I can also count color hex. Why do I want both the color and the, hex, uh, and the graphs? Because I might want to make a plot out of this. I might want to say, let's say the number of paintings compared to the color, and we do a bar plot. Uh, and that's it. So already we're saying, okay, here's the color, here's the n. Not much of a, not much of a, of a plot until I say I want to, let's see, let's make it a little bit better and order it in descending order. But let's do the really, the, the more interesting thing we can do, which is do, I'm trying to remember how, um, yes, the way, uh, what I want to do is give each of these the color that it actually is. I want this to be white, I want this to be burnt dumber, I want us all to find out what plethotholo green is. <laughs> so I think the way we do that is we do fill I meaning identity on color hex. If this works, yes, that's the one. So I is in a, um, uh, I is a, is a no, uh, it built into base R and it notifies like I want this literal thing. That's the way that ggplot understands. I don't mean I want a legend of each color is this thing. I want uh, it should be the color. So man, look at just looking at that. Doesn't it kind of look like a, I don't know? It kind of looks like a landscape. I think if we're looking at it, we're seeing like a. Um, uh, oh, we're, we're kind of seeing this like oh yeah, there's there's a lot of darks. There's um, some lighter colors, uh, but yeah the. Um, Mostly uses the reds use like bright red, burnt up, or a little bit of uh, one paint uses this word called uh, Indian red uh, or crimson. Yeah, so um, uh, so we're kind of seeing this like uh, already a bit of this story. Let's make this a little bit. Um, I like this plot, so I'm gonna uh, say number of paintings. I don't think uh, what colors. I like to title plots by the by the question the answer. Did Bob Ross use the most? Here we go. Um, all right. Any idea? Uh, anything else, folks, want to do with this plot? Anything bothering people about it? Things want to change? Can't really see the white. Yeah, you can't see the white. I wonder how can we give it an outline? I think what I can do is I can say color. I've got color, but I can say color equals black. Fill equals that didn't work. I oh yeah, I gotta say I. Black, just like I used for the color hex, I can say give each of these an outline. That's too thick. Uh, let's try gray. I'm not completely crazy about that either. We could also try using a, uh, a background. Yeah, I'm not. Um, I'm not crazy about this approach. So let's try using. I can use theme gray, the built-in ggplot2 theme. You know, I'm less crazy about the ggplot2 theme uh, default, like gray theme in general. But it might work better in this case, as you kind of see in the background. Can we get rid of the grid? Yeah, I, uh, I like it. Let's do. Uh, let's do it. So we do theme. Uh, let's see. It's um. Uh, so we do this. My it's panel grid element blank. That's the one. We can get rid of. Um, we also might want to get rid of this this bit of gray space it's in between there. Whew, I remember, uh, does anyone know how to get rid of this gray space? It's been a long time since I did, I did this. I think it's in scale. Scale, yeah, so it'll be scale, y, um, uh, y discrete, but what do we, what do we say? Expand yeah. equals zero, no, zero. I think, I think it has to be four elements of zero. Ah. All right. Let's find. Let's find. Let's uh, see if we, if, we, if we can find that out. It's um, it's ggplot to remove space under ticks. The um, it's something about expand. Uh, I do feel like that's expand. See, expand zero zero. Oh, you know, maybe I needed to add it to the um x uh axis. Ah, that's the one. I bet we can do. All right. All right, so expand zero zero, we have it uh, flat. Great background, 
I think it's I think it's pretty good. All right, and now we can find out Thalo green. That doesn't look green at all. <laughs> all right, first plot down. What um uh, uh any any requests? What's the next graph we're gonna make? Next question we want to answer. Can we do something over time? Yeah. How about colors over time? All right. Let's the um. Uh, so let's see. So we've got this table already of Bob Ross colors. Uh, something I'm noticing is that the, the, we have these numbers. Oh, you know, we have these seasons. So we can actually do count season color color hex. And now we know within each season how much um, how much uh, each each color is being used. So we can use season and fill equals i color hex geom. Uh, so there are a couple of ways we can do this plot. So this is we're looking at the color palette evolving over time. I don't know that the total is that interesting. So I'm going to want to do it as, now I'm trying to remember is this position is position. Uh, what is it? It's position. Uh, there's, a, there's a name for this. And I can't remember, um, remember how, to, how to get everything out of a total. It's called a spinogram. How do we get uh, all these out of a total? I think I'm gonna. Did anyone remember? What I'm trying to do is I want all of these to be out of a, as a total out of, of a percentage. We can do this in dplyr. That's I guess what I'm gonna do. Uh, divided by n percent. Here we go. So now we can see the um, as a bar plot the. Uh, the way that the colors have been changing over time. You know, I think the whites in between each of these bars are kind of bugging me. So I'm going to change this to an area plot. Now the funny, now I don't even know why this is giving a, a weird look with like all the triangles and such. So I think what's happening is that we have zeros and the, ze and it's, the geom area doesn't handle the zeros all that well. So anyone know how we can fix that? Function called complete, where I want to say I want to complete all the combinations of season and color hex, and I'm going to fill n and percent with zero. Uh, it won't it won't help me with the color, but that's okay. So what that means is now, oh yeah, season zero, uh, season one, nobody used this color, and now that I've expanded that out, I think. Ah, we're be it's better, but something's up with that top uh, with that top bar. So, <clears throat> first of all, I do like this. One thing I like about this idea is that you take you basically if you take all of Bob Ross's paintings and you stuck them into a blender and you arrange the blended results uh, stacked on top of each other, it would look something like this. Uh, anyone see a, t a tre um, trend over time? Well, I think it's going to depend a lot on what that top, what the. Um, Black uh, kind of polygons at the top are doing. So let's see if we can figure, we can sort out what's going on uh, there. What color black? I bet that's midnight black. Uh, but the uh, sometimes this happens when you duplicate data. Oh, does the same color have different? Ah, okay. So the problem is there was at least one color that was popping up um, multiple times under different uh, color names. So that, that this fixes it. All right, let's polish this up. Um, season. Percentage of so it's not really a percentage of colors used across paintings. So it's not percentage of paintings that it's used, and it's it's uh, out of all the out of the full set of colors, and scale y continuous labels. Ah, uh, percent format. All right. Use of color. All right. It's a little hard to see here on the. Um, I think it's easier to see on the TV. Uh, yes, it's definitely easier to see on the TV. Uh, let me try turning off the lights just in case it uh, it helps for future plots. Ah, uh, that's pretty. That's pretty good. Folks, okay with the lights off? Yeah. All right. Let's do it. Um, this way. All right. What are people seeing of, of change of use of color, Bob Ross? I think so. Maybe yeah. The, the, when did his fortune get stolen? We could throw a little dashed line right there. Yeah, it does look like he less green around season twenty-one. Less green. The uh, we're we thinking like this. This bar. Like 
Dark green. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Is there less green? Oh, maybe, and then maybe... the one below. Yeah, the like. It, this one. A darker green. I was just making a green joke. It wasn't worth it. Oh, <laughs> oh, okay. I get it now. Ah, right, I hear it was called. Yeah. Uh, one thing we see is he switched uh, from one like um, uh, I don't know what, what this would be before or after one umber or whatever it is to uh, to another. I think that's the only like swap out we can see at least based on what what is collected in this data set. So larger portion of black, kind of the same same number, amount of use of white. Maybe a little bit less red near the end. All right. Pretty cool. So, yeah, I'm, it's uh, oh. ah, that is that is really uh, that's really cool. Well, we can then what uh, we can ask is we can test this theory by looking at the titles. So we don't um, the other Bob Ross data set I looked at, which maybe we can join in, had things like what objects were in the paintings. Uh, so yeah, let's actually we'll, we'll pull that in, in a minute. But first, let's take a look at the painting titles. Who has uh, analyzed text data before? Nice. Who's used the tidy text package before? Nice. So tidy text is um, is uh, one that that um, Julia Silge and I created in uh, 2016, and it's for analyzing data using the um, it's an R package for analyzing data using uh, uh, the, the tools in the tidyverse like dplyr and ggplot2. And the way that it works is we've got our Bob Ross clean. Uh, Blah, Ross tidied. We've got our clean data. Uh, if I just selected painting and let's say uh, season uh, painting title, the way that it works is I say I want to unnest tokens. I want to have ins instead of um, just uh, one row for uh, library tidy text, Instead of one row per painting, I want one row per word. So what I say is word and painting title. What it does is is um tur is turn it lowercase, but also split it so it's now one row per word instead of one row per um uh, uh, per painting. So now I can I can do uh, I can count it and say okay, what are the most common words? used in Bob Ross paintings. And we do have some things like of, in, ah, uh, but something I think is cool is that actually the most common ones are mountain and winter. Now we can start saying things like, oh, are, are, the, are the, the color scheme used in paintings with the word mountain different than the color schemes used in paintings with the word winter? Uh, we have some words like of, in, a. We could probably uh, get rid of those, so there's a tool for that. Um, uh, we have a table of stop words that comes with the, with the package, uh, removing some uh, words that are a little less interesting. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, remove those with an anti-join. And this is Bob Ross words. Uh, let's take, let's include colors and color hex. Let's look at, let's do season and episode and num colors. That's basically all, all of them. All right. So now I can start asking things like, let's see, uh, let's count, uh, let's count uh, common words, uh, but let's also say instead of counting the word, just counting the words, let's ask a question about the words. Let's ask a question like, average colors. What are the average co colors, you, paint colors used in a painting that contains the word mountain or the word winter? I don't know if we'll see anything here. 11 or 12 or 15, oh, um, and I also want n is the number of paintings. Ones that use, uh, uh, so this is interesting, ones that use uh, winter have on average only 7.4 colors compared to ones that use mountain or lake. Ah, so winter, maybe we use a smaller palette. Uh, let's try a graph of those top. Um, man, winter is an outlier. Let's make this a little more interesting. Size is N. And colors used, word in painting title. You know, I expected this to be a little more boring than it is, but I think winter. Barn, I guess, being kind of on the, the lower end, uh, that is somewhat interesting. Uh, and valley 
using the most colors. Uh, that's kind of cool. My next idea is let's look at what the um, let's let's look at the at, at, at the colors. Let's try let's like show the average palette for something that contains one of these words. So what we can do that is we take this set of words. Who has seen F, um, FCT lump? I love this function. Uh, what FCT lump does is take the, the less common words that appear in a column and put them all into an other category. So we can say word and the top, let's say, I don't know, we'll take 15 words that have, um, yeah, let's say we have uh, 15, uh, 15, we'll take the 15 most, most common ones, keep them around and put all the rest in a, in lump them into one category. Then I group by word uh, and the, um, oh, nope, I'm gonna, oh, then I'm gonna count word and color. Here we go, uh, oh, nope, color needs to be unnested. So the trick is I need one row per, here we go. This is the number of paintings um, in, that include the word autumn that use this color crimson. Maybe not surprising that, that the word, well, already can see like, oh yeah, the word uh, autumn includes a lot of crimson, red, yellow, uh, but, but we really can't tell much until we compare it to the other ones. So I'm going to do a group by word percent is n over some n. And I'm going to plot these. We're going to say put the, let me see, percent word. Here we go. I don't know. What am I getting from this? What are other folks getting from this? The uh, white in winter. That's true. White white leads white leads uh, in winter. Uh, the uh, and uh, and not a lot of, not a lot of orange. Uh, but the um, you know what, what this is telling me though the way that I'm, I realize now I'm looking at it I don't want it. This is not the right way to visualize this. Uh, because orange being like so small here and so much bigger everywhere else is kind of hidden the way that we're visualizing it. I have a different idea. Uh, my, my, my different idea is we, let me see, by word color. What if we facet? So uh, we say facet by word, and then we say the percentage of that word. Uh, we say, let's see, percent color. And let's order No, I don't want, nope, I want it faceted by color, not by word. And I want, there's a couple more steps I'm gonna need to do here. Oh, um, yeah, one is, I. Uh, yeah, this is not much of a graph yet, but just wait till we're done with it. So free y, and, uh, Let's lump together, hmm, let's not lump together the colors. Uh, let's see. Let's do fewer colors. Oh, let's do fewer words. Let's order within. Um, Percent within order within each color. Go and let's. Better. Still do a couple more adjustments usually, but the um, but the scale X.
percentage of All right, normally I do a little bit more like uh, cleaning up in terms of like the size of text and things like this, but this is pretty reasonable. Uh, what are folks seeing? Feels to me like there are some colors that are pretty standard. Like you'd see like crimson shows up in like 8% of, that's not the top, up, le up top left. Crimson shows up in, in like 8% of everything, uh, but the, um, uh, with maybe a little bit of exception of like winter and waterfall that are a little bit off. Uh, but then you have things like cadmium yellow where it's used twice as much in some than others. And I realize to make this relative point kind of land a bit better, I might want to say, I'm going to put the x-axis free now they're on, and let's put, let's use theme gray. I hate that grid. <laughs> I'm glad it's not just me. Yes. Yeah, so we can see that now one thing this really gets across is like, okay, white way more in winter, but kind of standard everywhere else. Uh, liquid clear, liquid clear waterfall uh, be at the top, that makes some uh, sense to me. And then there's, um, yeah, you've got, and then, ah, there's really a lot of variation in burnt umber, uh, much higher in stream than in, in a cabin for, uh, like, yeah, three times higher in, 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 in stream than in cabin. I don't know if I would have expected bird umber to pop up in streams, but I guess it's kind of a rare color overall. Whew. All right, so that's looking by uh, combinations of words and paintings. All right. Any ideas for what we should analyze next? I've got two ideas. One is we could try, let me see. We could try something that puts, that actually brings the, the actual image in. And a second idea is we can, uh, so, so bring it from, from that online, um, uh, the, those sources. The other option we have is to, uh, where's my Tidy Tuesday? Is we could bring in um, the, the other Bob Ross data set, which doesn't have data about color, but does have data about what objects are in each, um, are in each uh, episode, so we can try linking objects to colors. Who wants to bring in, the, bring in images into a ggplot? And who wants to join to the other data set involving objects? Anyone got any other ideas? Can you cluster the images based on what's in them? Clustering, or based on what's in them or based on colors? Colors, These colors. colors, yes. Or either. Or, uh, yeah, that's true. Identify outlier paintings with unusual palettes. Yeah, so higher, for example, we could do hierarchical clustering on, on the, the set of colors. Uh, who wants to cluster? I think that most wins. Let's, all right, let's start by doing, let's do some clustering. So to cluster, mostly the, uh, here we go, uh, we've got, Bob, let's see, we've got words, we've got colors. Go. Uh, when we uh, when we cluster, what we're mostly looking at is let's see, uh, let's Bob Ross colors select. Let's do painting title, season, episode, and uh, color and color hex. Uh, what we're mostly thinking of is um, is a matrix. Uh, we're looking at data that's going to look a little more like this. There's actually uh, this is an old school package. I'm going to say uh, let's have a painting yeah. Painting title uh, by color. This is the kind of matrix we would usually use if we want to represent um, data. As we say, now we have, okay, here is a uh, Cold Spring Day, Copper Winter, Mild Winter's Day, Perfect Winter Day, and we um, and then we have here's this matrix of of uh, ones and zeros. We actually had something a little bit similar in the original data, 
Uh, you know, I think we actually can use that now that I think of it. Let's take our Bob, our original Bob Ross data, pick all the all the um the columns from uh, black gesso through. Uh, where is the, what's the last one? Uh, is there in crimson? No, it's the, the first, yeah. I think that's about right. Is there, are there 18? There are 18. So this is the data that's represented instead of as a, so right now it's as a table. I do as, eh, I don't like, I don't like this version because then I have to give, give it row names and stuff. All right, we're going to use this, um, uh, we're going to use this approach. We're going to say, all right. So this is a matrix that has one if they used the color and zero if if, um, if they didn't. So there's a, there's a lot of classic uh, approaches we can take for um, for finding correlation. Uh, we can say like what are the co uh, colors are correlated or what paintings are correlated. So let's start by asking what are correlated colors. Uh, something that's, that's really um, uh, useful for this is a package called um, YDR. Uh, I didn't re uh, create all the packages we're using today, but I did uh, create this one. And it, what it, it's about is um, finding re correlations, uh, basically widening this data set. So it's, uh, right now it's one row per color and painting. Finding a correlation among the paintings or finding a correlation among the colors. So the reason that that's useful is that I might take my colors and say, uh, what are the pairwise correlation between a... Um, uh, between two colors appearing based on in the same painting. What this will say is, um, is uh, if a painting contains one of these colors, does it contain the other? One would mean they always appear together. Negative one would mean they never appear together. Zero would mean if the, um, uh, mean, means uh, it's independent of each other, if one appears versus the other. So we can see things like, okay, bright red and crimson, appear together more than you expect by chance based on um, a correlation of point uh, 0.22. We see some like dark sienna and midnight black are really strongly correlated. I'm going to plot this as a, let's see, um, item one, item two, there's a word for this, it's a, it's a I guess it's a heat map where we, uh, and we'll say correlation I don't like this uh, scale uh, fill gradient to low is red. Nah, low is blue, high is red, midpoint, midpoint will by default be zero. This is not that helpful. But this uh, what this is showing is like um is uh, here we go. Uh, been a while since so I did heat maps, uh, but I think I know how we're gonna how we're gonna salvage this. The um, text. text. Uh, one is the X. I want the text. One is you rotate this. The challenge with this is that it's not um so is is not sorted. Really, we want these to be clustered together. There is a really um. There are a couple of, uh, this is one of the few things I use built-in R tools for, where we actually can take, instead of, of, of um, working from a tidy data, we take this matrix, let's see, it's been a while since I did this, uh, we take a correlation of the matrix and heat map, built-in heat map function on the correlation of the matrix. So there we go. Now, the, um, here, the, the colors, the yellow and red, don't actually rep represent yellow and red, or some of them do. But we can say, uh, this would say, like, okay, what are the clusters of, um, uh, that tend to appear together? And you can see, okay, uh, midnight black and dark sienna appear together, and then you've got, you know, it's some block, and then you've got a block up there of yellow ochre, Indian yellow, bright red, cadmium yellow, sap green, that, uh, that tend to appear together. You can kind of see three maybe three blocks or something like that, or I guess two blocks top level of colors, but I'm not getting uh, as much out of it. But I think what might be interesting is we try, cor instead we try correlating paintings. There are 400 paintings. It's gonna look, I think, less than perfect, but let's take a look what we can get. Here we go. Say four, that does not look like 400 paintings. Oh, it's not 400 paintings. It'll only show us, it'll only show us a portion. So back when I worked in biology, I did my PhD in biology, and we, uh, we did a lot of things with, with heat maps like this. This is, um, what this is doing is it'll cluster your, 
it'll, cl it, it, it'll cluster both the rows and cluster the columns. Uh, and since so we try and look for like, oh yeah, here's a blo uh, block of colors that go together. Um, but what, are we, uh, what we're seeing here, all right, all right. one thing that I'm seeing here is that, the, uh, let's actually, let's sample that. So let's say I'm gonna take only Let's do 50 paintings. Oh, these are the first 50 alphabetically, which is a little uh, corny, so I'm gonna do. Random sample of 50. Uh -huh. What did I do wrong? Missed the comma. What we're trying out here is clustering 50 paintings based on the colors used. The most interesting bit here is this tree. So this is called the dendrogram, and it's about cluster, <coughs> excuse me, clustering similar uh, color profiles together. So one thing we can see here, for example, is there's um. There's two up here at the top. It's funny because it oh, looks like, let me see, can I, can I zoom out? Is it going to show any more? Ah, uh, there it is. Yeah, there are the two paintings. County Creek and Valley View that use the exact, it's very hard to read this for distance, I know. County Creek and Valley View use the same, um, uh, use the exact same color palette. And then there's other ones that use uh, similar color palettes. Where here, um, the red, in this case, the red just means a, a, a color was used and the, um, uh, yellow means it wasn't. Uh, so the um, so here we're looking at yeah. We're, we're, uh, I think we can do this, uh, but yeah, th this is looking at like clusters of paintings together. It's a little hard to get uh, something out of this. We're seeing like surprising falls and gray mountain things. It's the same. I'm going to try one other approach to clustering. Which is dist. I'll be trying out these built in functions I haven't used in a while. Here we go. Oh boy. So this is cluster. Oh boy, this is, this is impossible to read. A little better. Okay. What we did here was, was take a hundred random uh, paintings and cluster them. And one thing we can see is, okay, there's actually a whole block of ones here that a lot of them have the word mountain. There's, uh, yeah, mountain and oval, mountain river, peaceful reflections, purple mountain range. Uh, so there's a block that use similar colors. I guess we had to say there's maybe two clusters of Bob Ross paintings. We'd have like this, this batch and then this batch. I'm not getting, just from look, glancing at them, I'm not necessarily getting like, oh yeah, this is the, um, these are the, uh, the, dis the, the two different types of paintings. But that's what I'm getting, uh, this is what I'm getting for now, yeah. Hmm. Anyone have other ideas for things they want, ways they want to look at this? Who's used principal component now? Oh. I was going to suggest, can we do a network analysis of colors used together per season, see how it changes over time? Oh man, I don't know. See, <laughs> correlations <laughs> over time? That's pretty brutal. That, that's pretty esoteric. But network, ooh, so, all right. Oh, okay. Let's try, I've got two ideas for, for things. One is, um, let's try showing this network a bit differently. Uh, show it as, here we go, instead of as a heat map, Let's show it as a network. Who has made network plots? Because you said network analysis. Who's made network plots in R before? Great tool for, oh, I may zoom back in for everyone. Great tool for this is, oh, yeah, um, is ggraph, uh, which is um, for, for uh, networks using uh, the grammar of graphics like ggplot. The beautiful thing about ggraph is, uh, ggraph, uh, let's see, geom is, uh, let's see if I can remember how to use it. It has been a while. Yes, all right. Correlation greater than point. All right. 
All right, the great thing about uh, GDRAF is that we can say um, is that it can feed from directly from a tidy analysis into making a network plot. So for example, I, I say, all right, I want, um, I want to do, let's see, edge link. Um, oops. Uh, there we go. Uh, GM node. And I want a different layout. Here we go. This is a way of looking at, at clusters of, um, so this is a way of looking at clusters of colors. Uh, it works a little bit better than heat maps. So the way that it works is it says the correlation, the, um, the links between these are correlation, and I can even say AS uh, alpha equals correlation. Uh, so the stronger and weaker ones. And this lets us say the, um, okay, the uh, clusters of colors that tend to appear together using GGRAF. But I think it's gonna be a little more interesting if we try doing it on the paintings instead of on the colors. Paint, uh... Man, that is one way to show it. Let's see the, uh, let me do one more thing. The, uh, all right. The, what this does is show, actually, oh, that, that makes it a lot clearer, <laughs> actually, if you look at it this way. This is um, any pair, of, uh, each point represents one painting, and then the, um, uh, it's connected to the ones that, that uh, use a similar color scheme. Uh, so one thing that, I'm, uh, that we see from this is that the top one, there's a cluster that use exactly the same color up there, Mount McKinley and Quiet and stream, stream and Mountain Lake. And there's this one that uses, uh, uh, then, then there's, yeah, there's this cluster where there's like one that, and then a lot of ones that are very similar to it, even if they aren't necessarily quite as similar to each other. Uh, so we saw from the color profiles that there were a lot of things that had extremely similar colors. So it's not surprising that there's a lot of things that are uh, uh, here that are, that are like tightly correlated together. But yeah, this is one we could, we can try and draw circles around clusters. The other idea was an animation. Do you want to see an animation? And then we, uh, then I'll, yeah, I'll, I started at 6.10, so I usually like to go for one hour. Does that work for you? Yeah, or, I think it's, it's fun. So you still need to do PCA, too. I do need, I, I can do PCA. Who wants to see, well, let's ask. Who wants to see an animation? Nobody's in, nobody's in animation. Who wants to see principal component analysis? Oh, awesome. All right, let's do the, let's do uh, principal component analysis. So who's used principal component analysis before? Principal component analysis is, find, is uh, uh, about finding, um, it's a little like cluster analysis, but it's about fuzzy clusters. It's about what are the underlying drivers of variation in the data. Like maybe there's, um, there's lots of variation, but mostly it fits into, into one spectrum of maybe more wintry and more summery. Uh, so the, um, so principal component analysis is a mathematical tool for pulling out those sources of variation. And the, um, the package, the, uh, uh, YDR package provides a way to, to, to do it on this color, this tidy color data set. What we do it is, let's see, it's called widely SVD, and remember now we do, the item will be the painting, the uh, feature is the color, and the, oops, missing, oh, uh, painting title. Painting title, color, painting title, color, and the uh, oh, the value would have to be always one. Gotcha. So what um what this does here we go is uh let's actually do it the other way around. Let's do principal component analysis on the colors. What are the underlying um yes so. This would say something like, 
If you ever hear of uh, folks, maybe the social sciences or a magazine say there are two types of people or people fall along a spectrum, um, I was saying, uh, you, a lot of those are built on analysis like like this, or factor analysis, which is closely related. Which says, like, um, if you take a, you could take lots and lots of traits and you you narrow them down to there's one underlying correlated trait that is driving uh, that is driving this variation. We can see something like it here, where if we um, and this is this is here. What I'm uh, what we're finding is uh, find this. If I say what is the top biggest source of variation, like what are what these colors tend to tend to either you do use a lot on this side of the spectrum or a lot on this side of the spectrum, the first principal component that is the one driving the largest amount of variation would be here we go. Let me clean this up. Right, would be usually so. So there's a trick here, which is that usually the the biggest source of variation in these is which one is the most common, and we do know Ind Indian red is the uh, the least common. So there's like there's one source of variation that is a lot of uh, paintings use titanium white and, and each of these other ones. Let's bring in the second. Let's look at the second dimension. Yeah. This I think is a little bit cleaner as a all right. So this is this what this is saying is the biggest source of variation among paintings is some use a lot of burnt dumber, follow whatever green, sap green. Let me speaking of which, let's not try to remember what these colors look like. Let's say fill is color hex, which I will need to join. I don't have the color hex, but I can get it with a join. I do distinct color color hex. There we go. Uh, this value doesn't have a real scale. It's not like, oh, uh, you know, 0.5 paintings or anything like that. But it's saying there's paintings that use a lot of sienna, black, clear, um, then, and, uh, and black. And then there's paintings that use a lot of burnt dumber, green. Oh, you can kind of see it. It's kind of like rain, like variety of rainbow colors versus. Uh, Kind of just just black and and darker colors. So this is the the biggest source of variation across these um, uh, across these paintings. I can look at the uh, top four of these. Go if I facet by the dimension. Go and I might want to. So this is saying is that the um, uh, if, if we brought down, broke down paintings into just a couple of, of numbers that describe them, maybe one of how much uh, burnt umber and green and yellow do you use versus dark sienna, midnight black, and there's sort of another dimension here that I would describe as like well, that's kind of a, kind of similar. It's like light to dark, but now. Um, yeah, it's like, and then now Indian yellow and yellow ochre are the ones that are dri that are driving it, uh, versus Prussian blue is the extreme on the other side, and then there's kind of one more dimension that's black versus blue. Uh, so this brings it, the the um, paintings down into just a few dimensions. Um, who right, raise your hand if you've done principal component analysis before? Oh, awesome! Yeah. So uh, for um, those who haven't, I know this is kind of like. Do we know this should be a whole like week in a statistics class? We're just we're compressing it down to uh, my hand wavy, uh, you know, um, and half remembered explanation from grad school. But the uh, uh, the other way that we uh, when we could say how many principal components should we use when we're representing this data? How many are driving variation? A way to tell that is uh, uh, can I go widely? Uh, I got my widely SVD. I don't know. I, um, I... Huh. 
Well, I'll have to do it on the Matrix itself because I can't quite do uh, can't quite do it with widely SVD. But that's okay. I'll do let's see, value decomposition on the Matrix. There is a trick to this. That's the one. Hmm. So the um, this is a, is percent of variance explained by each um, principal component. Turns out the first one, which is kind of the most boring one of just how many colors are being used, is the thing that's uh, driving most of the variation. But if you uh. If you ignore the, so that, that that's never the most exciting uh, result you can you can get, uh, but we kind of see up to dimension five. What you usually do with this is you look for where's a break point. The first, the next couple of dimensions each are somewhat uh, relevant. Uh, reason this is interesting is we can, um, uh, yeah, anyway, that's I don't have an explanation of that. All right. Uh, so the last thing we can do is ask, for, for let's say we've got the second principal component. We've got the sec this one where we're saying something like, where was I? To, uh, we were saying that the, that the second color, um, yeah, the second color of umber versus, uh, of like, kind of blue and green and umber versus just black and sienna, that, that seems to drive a, a, solid amount of, a solid amount of variation. We could flip this around, where instead of saying, here we go, instead of plotting of a, by painting, we look at the same principal components, but we flip it and we say, what are the paintings that best most describe each of these dimensions? The way that I do that is look at the top, uh, 20, Paintings in each dimension, where we say, all right, uh, color. Uh, That's not an interesting analysis. Oh well, the um, the story this usually can say is something like, "Here are the one here are the ones that are most extreme in one direction versus the other." I'm not quite getting that here. I don't know. I don't know. The trouble is this is binary data, and binary data doesn't always uh, sing, do that well under PCA. But all right, we saw an example. It's improv. It doesn't always work out. So uh, let's we'll, we'll go through everything that we that we uh, did today. So we uh, started with the um, we took, we had this uh, table of um, uh, of all the of colors. We saw that there one of the columns colors was uh, was compressed together, where we say something like the um, uh, with the brackets and quotes and such. So we we tidied those, turned that into a list column, uh, tidied it so we could actually answer questions like here are the most common colors, and built our first plot out of that. Then we looked at we um, broke apart the uh, Oh, where's my where's my one of of change over time? Where's my one of a change over time? There it is. Um, so we also said, then we said, okay, how is it changing? We saw, okay, Bob Ross might not have a blue period, but he does did change around season eight to use some more black. He switched from one type of um, red to uh, to another, uh, and um, uh, kind of consistent use of things like white. Then we started comparing it to things with um, like what words were uh, were used. So the uh, we said here we are. Nope, uh, we looked at. We used high text to break apart the words in each so we could get one row per word. Then let's answer something like, for each of these words, what's the average number of colors that are used? We see, okay, winter tends to use fewer colors, maybe valley and waterfall use, use uh, the most. And then we broke out to what, co what specific colors are used in each of these, um, uh, in each of these paintings. We tried it out with like uh, stacking the palette and we tried it out another one where we said, here we go. The, um, well, uh, these are the words that uh, some we notice that some words. Uh, 
show a lot of very uh, a lot of variation, some very little, like there's some colors that are kind of standard or equally common, uh, and others that uh, where it depends a lot on what the subject of the painting is about. So then we did a little bit of um of uh, clustering and, and network analysis where we start where we said go, nope, not here. Where is my cluster? Where we try we created some um, uh, clusters and heat maps where we said okay here's the um, uh, the, uh, the ways that uh, the, the class of paintings that look um, that look similar. We looked at um, and then we did principal component analysis where we tried saying uh, what are the dimensions that drive the most variation and like the the, uh, the dimensions or palettes that that uh, show, that show the, um, uh, the, the the drive variation across how uh, what colors are chosen in paintings. All right. Uh, any questions on anything we did today? First. And I'm excited, yeah, excited to have you. Like. Folks, you have quite a chance to uh, ask DRAB any questions about what he did, which of these packages he wrote versus others. Uh, ask, ask away. Well, I'm happy to do that at the bar, too. Or oh, yeah, we're people... also going to go to the bar to talk. Yeah. Oh, oh, well, I'm not mic'd up yet, but so I don't think, let me, let's see if there's any questions here. Ah, okay, there are some questions here. Let me, how do I, how do I mic this? There, I can't tell by just feeling it. How many people were on the live stream? Like 40? Yeah. All right, I think, I, I think my mic is up again. All right, let's see. Um, what was the name of the color that does not say anything about his coverage on the canvas? Huh? What's the name of that? Mention of the name of the color. Oh, okay, yeah. No, it, it, uh, it would be cool. It is, I think what it's saying is a color could be mentioned, but only used in one little dot or in mm -hmm. a large part of the canvas. Yeah, that would have been cool, I think, to show like how much of the painting was it used. Uh, uh, that would be a cool data set. Oh, you know what we could have done? We could have downloaded the images and found out. <laughs> that would have been neat. Maybe next time. Like a mosaic of images. In September, October, Come back and do the mosaic of images. Slam. Nice. Yes. He does mix colors. What's that? He mixes the colors. Yeah, yes, yeah, that's true. It would be cool maybe to, to like use the hex values. I forget how it works to figure out like what, because every color is a mixture of the certain primary colors. So you could figure out, instead of doing the color analysis that we did over time, break that down by primary color, red, yellow, blue, black, white. Oh, that would be, that would be really cool. Like, I have no idea how we go about Going from, do you have, like, going from a hex to a, to a painting. I forget how you do it, but I, I know you could do it. You saw that TED Talk video. I, I didn't see any TED Talk. I didn't <laughs> I know. I know how we do it with, like, like the, they can do it with RGB. So the, um, uh, like, these represent three hexadecimal numbers. Uh, so this one, for example, has, uh, which, which color is, uh, select, uh, let's do a. But you could just look at the first of each pair, like four, one. Yes. Uh, you, you, so like, um, so that's a, that's a good call. Is like, is so here, crimson. This one has uh, four e and it ha hexes a, a lot of red, as we expect. Um, some green, no blue. RG, RGB, I think is right. Yeah. Uh, and then black has no has no colors at all. Bright red has only red, and um, and so on. So we could. That's a good call. Yeah. But my understanding. But you can use um, color. Hex color. There's a function, a great function for this called extract, where you say uh, from color hex, I want the columns uh, red, green, and blue, and you give it a pattern, a regex pattern of this dot dot, and now we've split it out into like red, green, and blue. And another step to get to that into to the, those numeric. Yeah. Sorry, the thing you were saying about the PCA, um, you said that, it, I just wanted to ask more about, you said that usually like a little trick is that usually one of the more driving underlying correlations is the thing that's most commonly used? Yes. You can, um, so we, uh, you just like, like a, maybe a different example that's not with colors. I've heard of PCA, but I hadn't heard that part. And yeah, so you, there, there's a way to fix it, which is you center the rows first, but it's, um, sorry, it's been a while since so I use this like yeah. uh, professionally, not just for uh, fun. I think, oh yeah, so, so the, um, so this, uh, if, we, if we had a data set with something like populations, it's not a good, uh, 
It's not, I, I, I don't have a great example. Let me. Right. Uh, well, I mean, I guess for the color white was the most frequently used thing. So in this thing, so you were, were you saying that maybe you would expect that the amount of white being used would most likely drive the variation in the other color being used? It's more that the, the goal of, of these is to, is to um, yeah, so the, so the goal is, is, is to say you add some amount of this first principal component and some amount of the second and some amount of this third together and it gets something very close to the, to the actual combinations. And you want to be able to approximate the overall, um, the, the, the distribution of the paintings as close as you can just with a couple of those principal components. So the um, if the first one is just you take the, um, the average frequencies of each of them, that's already a pretty good yeah, that's, that's, that's kind of like where you'd want to start, is you start from everything has the average, and then you move around from there. It's kind of the way to think about it. I'm not the best at explaining this though, part, though. Yeah. Yeah, oh yeah. For the network graph, could you explain how it's possible for one painting to be similar to a lot of them, but none of those to be similar to the other ones in that cluster? Sure, I think that what we'll... The question yes, so the question is, in a network graph, how can um, one painting be, a lot of paintings be similar to one, but then they're not similar to each other? So I think actually the main reason for that was just that the, there's, I think there's a lot of ties here. So here we go. Was this the graph that I had? Let's see, yes. So I think what happened, now that you mention it is, oh yeah, all that happened is all of these are exactly the same. So it, um, it didn't, uh, I should have just said filter correlation is one, and there are thousands of pairs of, of paintings with a correlation of one. That's kind of the challenge when you're working just from 18 pieces of data. Yeah, this is what, uh, uh, yeah. So that was all that was happening was it somewhere being included by chance and some weren't. Uh, thanks for calling me out on that. Uh, we have some, like uh, these here, the, the, ch the links represent only correlations that are exactly, the, so the paintings that are exactly the same. So this were a lot of paintings that use the same combina uh, combination of colors. <clears throat> um, I don't have a lot of familiarity, familiarity with clusters. I've never seen that before, but I'm just wondering, if, because it's, we have so much, but they are similar, I wonder if we, would it help to categorize you know, words and looking at the amount of colors. So if we group the words into like land words, water yeah. words, season words, would we see more correlation? Or do you not want to do that? Do you want do you want it all at that granular level mm -hmm. to see the cluster words? I think it's a great question. The question is, could you also categorize, um, you, could you categorize words and look at their correlation? Um, so, so definitely, I think there are a few ways you, you could approach this. It depends on what you're trying to explore. If we were fitting a machine learning model, let's say we had, uh, oh, this would have been a fun data set to grab, is IMDb ratings of each of the episodes, and we want to predict how popular is this episode going to be. We might treat each word as a feature and each color as a feature. And maybe, and, uh, maybe we discover, oh, uh, one's including burnt umber are really popular, but ones including the word mountain are less popular. Um, but then uh, uh, often when you have uh, hundreds and hundreds of these features, you want to do dimension, uh, you find out a lot of them are redundant and a lot of them are very sparse. So two different problems you can run into. One is like, is as we saw, like some of these colors maybe are really used together a lot, but we don't need both of them. Some words are sparse, maybe this word, um, uh, so the word falls might have appeared a lot, but probably the word twin uh, might have appeared only once or very rarely. So then you, want, then you might want to, um, to bunch them together and do, um, uh, uh, and then like do, and, uh, yeah, group them by something like topic. So there are a lot of methods for doing that, and, um, but both of those are, are attempts to solve, the, as is PCA, solve the problem we call dimensionality reduction. Taking uh, dimensionality reduction, what we were doing with those 18 colors, we were taking an 18 dimensional data set, turning it into more like a four dimensional data set. Or we, we, could, do, we could have done the same to words as well. We could have said, here are the, um, the words that tend to appear together. That would have been a cool thing to do is combine words and, and colors and then do PCA there. Ah, uh, yeah, I think that would have been a little more. All right. Yeah. There's a virtual question, and then we'll do some giveaways and we'll get some more questions. Um, would anyone say that pivot wider, and I'm not Mike, so you have to repeat this. <laughs> would anyone say that pivot wider and pivot longer functions in tidy are may have some the same functionality of reshape cast? Oh, yeah, so the question is, do pivot longer and pivot wider in tidier have some of the same functionality as reshapes cast? Yes, so this is, so we're actually looking at three, gener uh, so this is a, uh, 
great like high risk history question. There are three generations of this kind of operation, at least three generations, of this operation of um, I have a of uh, I have data in one shape and I want to put it. I want to make it wider. I want to make it longer. If we're looking just so first actually was the reshape package, uh, which um, which. I think might have been deprecated a long uh, time ago because then there was Reshape 2. It's sort of been popular around, I think, like 2010 to 2012, the, don't quote me on that, uh, which um, included functions like ACAST and DCAST. So D, uh, and those are all about take something that's long and make it, uh, and make it wider or, or um, re reverse. So first there was, uh, we probably would have done this kind of step of like, take your Bob Ross colors, and do um, uh, let's see what what, what, what do we say is painting title by color. So decast would have been one used to be how we would we would do a step like that uh, a step like this. Later it was replaced by tidyr's spread, which would have done Bob Ross colors, and then it would set a uh, painting uh, color. Um, it would have just said color and value, and it would have needed a value column. And then that was, and that was a diff, uh, so, so then people were recommending spread over decast, and then spread was replaced by pivot wider. Uh, so th these, I think, are different generations of, the, um, of uh, solving a similar problem. Uh, and all by the same author, these are all created by um, Hadley Wickham. The big difference between the, uh, the reason I sometimes still go to reshape two is a function called a cast, which casts to a matrix. A, a is a reference to array. Uh, it's still it's still a little iffy to try, uh, tidy R and uh, really is meant to work with tibbles, not with matrices. So this is why I still sometimes plot a cast. If there's any other questions in this room, I'll choose any other questions virtually, and then we'll go to the bar. So we only have time for two. So if you're more than two, we're not doing it. You got to ask them at the bar, and it's one beer per question. <laughs> or whiskey. All right. Then virtual. Okay. Virtually says, can you recreate one of the ggplot graphs using lattice? No. <laughs> <laughs> no one asked that. That was for me. Ah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that would be. Yeah, of course. All right. Be. So with that, I guess. Um, thank you everyone for coming here uh, in person. Thank you everyone for being here virtually. August we will announce sometime after the conference. September we will announce after August. October, November, December, we need both space and we need a speaker. And just uh, join the Slack, post your jobs on there, and hopefully I'll see a bunch of you in the next coming months. I remember, discount code for all the events. Go to nyhackguard.org to find past talks. Um, we have a decade of talks up there. Um, the code NYHackR for any event we put on, you get 20% off. And yeah, just have everyone up. See you next month or see you next week. Thank you to D Rob, everybody.